Welcome back, Warriors. Yay! We're so grateful you're here this and every week. Yes. Yes. To your favorite anxiety sure. podcast. Mm-hmm. Favorite anxiety podcast. I mean, there let's just pretend like there's no other anxiety podcasts out there. I don't think there just are. Us. No. When I Google it, it's only us. <laughs> it's just us on the entirety of the Google. Yeah. Just, that's just it. Ang- just yeah. anxiety warriors. Yeah. This is, this is it. You've got you've got the one and only folks. <laughs> All right. Um, today we are going to be talking about being a pet parent Mm, and all the anxiety (laughs) that comes up with that and all the pet parenting anxieties. That's right. Um, you know, we had had, we've had so many guests share with us about what it feels like to be an anxiety warrior as a parent yep. to human children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and since you and I don't have any experience with that, no. and maybe we'll touch on that a little bit today. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have lots of experience with being fur mamas. We both have doggies. Yes. What are your doggies names? Tell everybody. Gnocchi. Although I actually just say Noki, right? But it's like the yeah. Is it Gnocchi? I mean, it's spelled that way. So if we were in Italy with her, we would probably say like gnocchi, right? Gnocchi. But, okay. But here we just call her gnocchi. 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 So is that like the Americanized version of that type of pasta? Like you're supposed um, to say gnocchi? I mean, I don't really know what you're supposed <laughs> to say. <laughs> you know, um, that's just like, I liked gnocchi, but I liked spelling it like the dumpling. Got dumpling. I'm, I have so many questions about it. Oh, it's a potato now. dumpling. Okay. I knew it was, I thought it was potato pasta. Mm. <laughs> I know it's, I, I, like it's a dumpling pasta. It's like, okay. Yeah. I'm not a fan. I'll be honest. I do love the name. I just yeah. don't like the potato dumpling or pasta or oh. whatever it is. Yeah. I am a fan of both. Okay. Um, but you know, like a year into it, I was like, oh, I wish I named her Mochi. Right. I don't know. That's I know. Isn't that cute? Yeah. My friend just named her little pig. She just got a, uh, a pet pig and her name is Mochi. See, it's a perfect name. It is a really cute yeah. name. Oh yeah. my gosh. That's so funny that you just said that. <laughs> um, it's a great name. Tell her. Yeah. So tell her good job. Good yeah. job. Um, so there's Noki and then there's arrow, like a bow and arrow. There you go. I know you say arrow. I say arrow. (laughs) It's like your upstate New York coming out a little bit. I don't say arrow. For me, it's arrow. (laughs) Long Island. (laughs) With your dog arrow. I don't even know what I said that was. It's the dog arrow. Arrow. (laughs) God, this is terrible. Okay. Um, And I have a cute pup. Yeah. His name is Hurley. And Mm. he's named after um, Hugo Hurley. Uh, which is from the show Lost. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. His, um, Hurley was Adam and myself's favorite character. And Hurley so when we character. got our dog back in 2011, we were mm-hmm. like, it's got to be Hurley. Technically, it was Hugo, but we never called him Hugo. It was always mm. Hurley because that was yeah. Hurley's nickname. Yeah. That's a great. Yeah. I love that. How disappointing. We just talked about our mundane TV series and how Lost was a disappointment. It's but true. Hurley but is not. Hurley is not. The character and the dog. Correct. <laughs> not disappointments. Yes. So, <laughs> so we named Noki Noki just because we thought it was cute, but we named Arrow Arrow. Um, because <laughs> no, don't fix it. it sounds perfect. Arrow, Arrow. Yeah. Um, we named him Arrow for two reasons. Uh, one, Dan uh, really likes airplanes, and there's one named Arrow, but also mm. Dan and I met through OK Cupid. Aww. And the arrow struck, right? Oh, so corny. So, so embarrassing. But so that's how we came up corny. with his name. <laughs> I love it. I want to vomit in my mouth. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. It's disgusting. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, really, that's adorable. I love it. Um, all right. So yeah, we kind of started talking about all the anxieties that come up with owning a pet Yeah, and how being pet parents or pet owners, it's a lot more, you know, so many people don't necessarily treat their pets like family, or they don't no. look at animals as members of their family, but so many people do. Yep. Right. And I feel, I always feel so validated when people are like, no, yeah. Like those are my those kids, are like your little fur babies. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, I think as non-parents, I know for me, I'll just speak for me. I always feel like 
I'm not in a position to sort of like complain or Mm -hmm. share my anxieties about being a fur mama because Mm -hmm. most people I talk to are human mamas or dads or parents or whatever. And I feel like that's a completely different animal. It's just a no pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That was terrible. (laughs) Um, and so I feel, I always feel like "Ah, I shouldn't be kind of, maybe I shouldn't talk to this person about how I feel about my anxiety surrounding Hurley or just, you know, around having a pet or pets or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, because this person is dealing with what I, what I I guess was conditioned to feel like was a lot more. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I know for me, I do look at Hurley as a member of our family. Yes. Why yes. wouldn't we have anxiety about that? And you care about his well being. Right, I have, exactly. I have always felt de- validated when I'm with people that have kids and I'm like, oh yeah, I have two puppies. And they're like, oh, those are so much harder. And I'm like, thank you. And I know it's different. It's that never different. happens to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's only happened twice, but okay. both times I felt seen, you know, cause they had kids and they had puppies mm. and, and they were like, oh yeah. Like the puppy is so much harder at the beginning, you know? And so, mm. um, but yeah, it was really funny because when we've had, um, parents on the podcast and talking about like postpartum anxiety or just anxiety with, you know, raising their kids and they were like, yeah, I would always pay attention to their poop or how much they ate. Or I'm like, I do that with my dogs. Like, it's like, I was like, all the overthinking these people are talking about is what I do on a day-to-day basis with my dogs. Right. Which yeah. just makes sense. As you said, perfectly put a few moments ago, it's like, of course we care about their well being and what they ingest yeah. is part of that. And so yeah. why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we overthink? Well, or why wouldn't we certainly think a lot thoughtfully yeah. about what they're eating and how often and it's a lot of, it's a lot of hard work and energy that goes into being a pet parent. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, totally. All right. So like what kind of comes up for you? Yeah. Thinking about this type yeah. of anxiety. So, okay. So the first thing that comes up for me is fear of judgment because everything I'm going to share, I feel like I'm very embarrassed about sharing. I am like, like, the overthinking and the amount of anxiety I have along with like all the joy and stuff with my pets is like, I'm like, please don't judge me audience. (laughs) I just love my dogs. (laughs) So that's the first thing. This is judgment free zone. Come on. Our warrior fam is going to hold you. Ah, and those pet parents will maybe get it. Um, so growing up, I grew up with cats right? I didn't grow up with dogs growing up. Um, I was afraid of dogs. I was always like a a small little peanut and, um, dogs scared me. They would knock me over. You know, I felt like they smelled like, you know, there was a lot of things I didn't like about dogs when I was younger. And, um, I grew up with cats. I loved my cats, but I never like had anxiety around my cat you know, I cared about them and everything. And maybe it's because I was a kid, you know? Um, and then a little bit later on when I was in my like early mid twenties and I was in that emotionally abusive relationship, um, that guy had a dog. And so he started having me care for his dog. And then he brought another dog into the mix. And then he brought another dog into the mix. And I never had owned dogs before. I knew nothing about training dogs. Um, Like even just stuff like dogs don't know their names. Like that is a sound. You need to pair that sound with something good, like a treat. So they learn, they want to come to you with that sound, you know, just like so many basics. And, um, and I feel like that guy also kind of just had me take care of the dogs a lot um, so that I wouldn't like see my friends and he had me cut back my hours at one of my jobs. And so even though I loved those dogs, I really resented my situation and Mm. I wasn't as like, I mean, I cared about the dogs, but I wasn't as like, how, how many times a day did they poop? How many times did they eat? Are they happy? You know, right. Right. Maybe I was like, are they happy? But you know, um, so I guess it was like, it was, well, it was 2019. Dan and I had been like dating for about a year at that point, I think around a year. And, you know, we were like in talks about getting a dog. We're like, yeah, I think we're ready for this. You know, I had already moved in. We were living together. It felt like we knew 
you know, where this was headed, why not start with a dog? And um, Dan has allergies, which is why like we would never even consider a cat, um, but he does have allergies with some dogs as well. And so we're like, all right, I guess we have to do like the hypoallergenic dog. And so we started looking into those dogs and we found out about Bernadoodles, which um, they're, they're a mix of uh, Poodle and Bernese Mountain Dog. And so um, we landed on getting a Bernadoodle and we were all excited and we started like learning all about training and we were watching a ton of training videos because we want a really well-behaved dog and you know how do you socialize the dog and and just like you know we were really excited for this dog and um which is Noki hmm. and um uh and then you know we were going to pick her up in uh April and in that time the pandemic happened. And so a lot of our plans for our dog changed because everything closed, you know? Um, and, and I say that partially because I don't want to, there's nothing wrong with the pandemic puppy, but we had planned it before the pandemic happened. Right. Um, and so basically right, right then, you know, we, we got Noki and at the same time, um, like a lot of my work ended. Right. So I became like the full time uh, dog trainer and groomer and dog mom. And, um, you know, we just were together a lot. And like, you know, she's a very well behaved, well trained dog because we had so much time to train her. And uh, then what happened was like she's just like a very active, playful, sweet dog. And she would really want to interact with all of these other dogs when we would take her for walks and everything. Um, and I'll get into why, like, I don't take her to dog parks and stuff in a, in a moment. But we were like, oh man, like this is a dog that needs another dog, right? And I know you never get a dog for your other dog. Like that's not what you do. But we knew that at some point we would want a second dog. And so we were like, well, we might as well get it now since we're still in a pandemic. And so we got her, her brother, Arrow, um, on her birthday. So about 10 months after having her. Um, and their personalities are just so different. Like she is active. She's very vocal. She advocates for herself. She's like, I want to play. I want to go outside. <laughs> like she really is she's like a vocal, vocal dog and tells us what she wants. Um, and then Arrow is much more, um, mellow. He just loves to sit and watch the world around him. Um, when he meets people, he wants to get right in their face and stare in their eyes and smell them. Like he just, he's like inhaling your soul. Like it's like, he's like, <laughs> that like, sounds dark. <laughs> no, in like this beautiful, like way. Yeah. He's just like looking at you and he just wants mm. to like know you, you know? Um, and, and he's just like, he's just a little cuddle bug. He's not as vocal he's playful with his sister and he's, he's playful, but he's definitely just so much more mellow. And, um, he's, he's so cute because so I'm obsessed with both my dogs. Um, when he <laughs> got, when he got fixed, um, he had to wear a cone. And so when Noki got fixed and she had to wear the cone, like her life was miserable. Mm -hmm. Like she was so upset and like, she never wanted to like go outside. Like it was, the cone was horrible. When the cone came off of her, she was fine. But anytime she wore it, she was like a different dog. Um, but with Arrow, when we put his cone on, like he was just this happy-go-lucky dog. And so like he got his nickname Bubs because he was just this bubbly boy, right? And so I was starting <laughs> calling him Bubbly Bubs. And, and so now it's really cute because he, he responds to the name Bubs as well as Arrow. Um, <laughs> and so um, he's just, yeah, so he's just this like easygoing guy. And so I'm obsessed with my dogs. But um, I also have a lot of anxiety um, about them. So uh, um, one of the things like I already mentioned that I do is like I pay very close attention to how much they eat every day right? They're both picky eaters. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. Like I have to mix their food a certain way. And I know some dog trainers might tell me not to do that, but, but they arrow has to eat because he has bialis vomit, which Noki used to have too, but she grew out of, which means if you, if they don't eat for a certain amount of time, then he vomits up bile. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
I know I could play the game of like, well, when you're hungry enough, you'll eat, but then I'll be cleaning up Bile's vomit everywhere. And I have already tried that. That's not fun. So, um, so I have to like make their food a certain way. And, and then I have to sit near them. (laughs) They eat. I am that dog parent. Yes. (laughs) Um, you know, and then I pay attention to like, um, how many times they go to the bathroom a day and what is the consistency, you know? And so I'm making sure everything is healthy there. Um, and then, you know, like where the anxiety start to come up is like, um, can I give my dog certain food, right? Like, can I give them apples? Can I give them pears? Can I give them berries? Can I give them sweet potatoes? Right. And all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but I learned really early on, um, about xylitol, which is like a dog killer. Right. And so there's xylitol that's found in natural foods. And then there's xylitol that is made from birch. And lately, I mean, I don't know what lately means, but in recent years, um, they started putting xylitol in peanut butter and in other things that people maybe give their dogs. And so, I mean, it's gotten to the point where like, I know I buy peanut butter that is just peanuts. That is it. It's like crushed peanuts. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you also want to be careful of like palm oil and, and all this. And, um, I remember one time I gave them Kongs with some peanut butter in it. And I, I had read the label like five times before I gave it to them. Right. I'm like, okay, it just says peanuts on it. It just says peanuts on it. Yep. There's no hidden ingredient. Like, like, you know, I just needed to reassure myself. Yeah. And then I gave them the peanut butter. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, what if it's not on the label? What if it's hidden somewhere else on the label? What if, you know, what if they didn't label it? And I'm like, oh my God, did I just like give my dog, even though I knew, I knew I didn't give my dogs xylitol, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like the anxiety in loving and caring for my dogs is like this, like this big monster that like just jumps out and latches on, right? And even though I know the monster isn't real, like I can't let it go. So mm-hmm. I had to like wait until Dan came home and um and be like, read the label. And he's like, no, it's fine. And I was like, okay, it's fine. But like I sat in anxiety, even though I knew I shouldn't feel anxious, probably for at least half an hour. You know, it was like, it's horrible. Like the it's just horrible. Right. And so, so that, you know, um, it's something that happens where like I'm very intentional and overthinking the foods I give them um, what other foods other people give them, you know, it's like, you know, don't hurt my dogs or I'm going to hurt you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then there's the anxiety of other people's dogs. And, um, you know, I've heard some horror stories about people that take their dogs to the dog park and then another dog attacks their dog and then Mm -hmm. their dog is never the same. Right. And so that, you know, I wish I felt comfortable taking my dogs to a dog park, but I've heard that story enough where I'm just at that point, at this point, I'm not comfortable taking them there. Yeah. Um, and for a couple of reasons, one is I don't want my dogs to be hurt and damaged, you know, and change the way they are in the world. Um, but also I really think that if someone's dog came and attack, attacked my dog, I might accidentally kill someone's dog. Like the rage in me. Yeah might hurt someone else's dog. So like, let's avoid that. Right. <laughs> like, Yeah. Like instincts kicking in. Yes, and stuff. yes. And, you know, I have found that dog owners like to lie about their dogs. Maybe they're lying to themselves. Mm. Right. But there's been a number of times. And like when, when Yoki was just a few months old, um, we, we kept her right in our yard for, you know, until she got all her vaccines. Cause I was afraid of Parvo. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we, so, and I remember this woman would always walk by and she was like, Oh, your dog's so cute. I love your dog. And she would always interact and she was super sweet. And one day she walked by with her dog who was a pit and I love pits. I am not knocking pits. The dogs I had in my twenties were pit bulls. They are the sweetest, sweetest, sweetest dogs. Yeah. Um, and, and so she was like, Oh, can my dog say hi to your dog? And, um, Dan and I were like, is your dog friendly? How do they deal with other dogs? Right. We would have said this if it was any dog. And the lady was like, oh, yeah, so friendly. And as they neared closer, the dog started growling and lunged at Noki. And we like Mm -hmm. picked her up and we're like, "Uh, okay, we're good. Thanks. But it was like in that moment, I was like, I can't trust other people about if their dogs are nice. You know, like, (laughs) why, why say that? Like, why risk a dog getting in a dog fight? Um, Mm -hmm. 
And so now I like always closely like, you know, observe when other dogs are walking by and how like their body language is with each other to make sure like when I'm walking, you know, in on a path on a trail and they want to interact, um, it's safe, right? You can tell a lot by body language of a dog, but also like if it doesn't seem safe and people are like, oh, let my dog say hi. I'm like, oh no, we're just working on training where we're just working on, you know, uh, socializing without interacting, right? And I like let them walk by because I'm like, do not come near my dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's like a lot of, of my anxieties. Like I don't want my dogs to get injured, you know? Um, yeah they've interacted with other dogs. It's not like I keep them from other dogs. We have friends with dogs, but we do it in a very intentional, safe way to know all everyone's safe, you know, um, our dogs and the other people's dogs. Um, but in recent time, um, my anxiety is just like in the last two weeks just spiked because, um, arrow has been diagnosed with a very, 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 very rare condition. Um, it's, it's called, I'm going to say it wrong, but it's called reflex, um, dysnergia, dys, dysnergia, dysnergia. That's it. Dysnergia. Okay. Dysnergia. I don't know. Anyway, I'll spell it's a it. very rare. It's very, very rare. Thing. If you Google it, you can barely find anything on it. Right. Mm. And basically you get that diagnosis as a dog. Um, when they have tested everything else and rolled out everything else. So um, about two weeks ago, um, he started acting like he had a urinary tract infection, which is rare for male dogs and rare for puppies, right? Mm -hmm. But he was going to the door a lot and um, he would go outside and only little spurts and drips would come out. He was starting to have accidents in the house, even though he hasn't had accidents in, you know, at least eight months or something crazy, right? Well, maybe like six, seven months. Um, and so we took him to the ER and the ER did like an ultrasound and a prostate exam and they tested his urine and all of those things and they couldn't find anything. So they gave us pain meds and said, see your vet, which we already had an appointment in for the vet the following day. And we saw the vet and the vet gave x-rays and another prostate exam and two more, two more urinary tests, one in-house, one they sent out, um, and basically everything. Oh, and he had had blood work for his annual, like a year, a, a week before. And so basically everything, you know, they did came back, everything on paper shows he's a healthy dog. Right. Um, but he was like straining to go. It was like horrible to watch it. It was like, he couldn't mm-hmm. empty his bladder. He would like put his body in these different ways to try to, you know, get the urine out. It was really, um, stressful to watch. Um, and so right now we have him on, um, about five meds, three in the morning, two in the evening. And, um, oh, and then he also got a catheter. If anyone's like, wait, what about, you know, and he got a catheter scope and there's no blockages and there's nothing in there like that. And so, and we're on a waiting list now to roll, uh, we have an appointment, um, in June to go see a specialist, a urinary specialist, and then probably a neurologist. Um, and the, you know, along with like the stress and anxiety and the grief, like he's my baby. He's one year, he's one year old. Like yeah. this is actually really painful, but I'm not going to think about it as I talk about it right now. Um, you know, but the thing is one, this is so rare. It is so rare that they don't really know what to predict with it. So he might just grow out of it at some point, which is obviously mm. the hope, right? Um, he might live with it his whole life. Um, and then I need to start thinking about like, okay, what do these meds do to his body? How does it change his, his way of living? Um, or, you know, there's, there's worse ways this could go as well, but be, because at the, during the catheter, they noticed that he's pretty much emptying his bladder. Everything seems pretty like good right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and since he's been on the meds, it's still been a little bit of a roller coaster where, you know, he seems to be emptying his bladder a lot better, but then like on Sunday, he was having a harder time again. And so, you know, it's like this, like back and forth of like, you know, but now right. he seems better again. Um, so that it's just been really stressful. Yeah. And I've become like a full-time helicopter dog mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. You know, like, like videoing his every pee, you know, like to see right. 
is there a change to like to show this to the specialist like you know and and just really checking in on his well-being and how he's doing and is he playful and what are his energy levels like um and so it's been it's been a lot um yeah before his diagnosis i could manage most of the anxiety um there was things that came up like sometimes you know before his before he was you know not doing well um things came up where like, I felt like I wasn't doing enough as a dog mom, even though I spent a lot of time with my dogs. So I started to set boundaries, um, around like my routine and I would give them like, you know, play and exercise and walks and all the stuff in the morning. And then I would give myself a good chunk of time during the day to do my work. Um, you know, and then, you know, so the routine really helped with my anxiety. Um, I, really practice reading labels and trusting labels. <laughs> mm. Um, and then, you know, um, another way that I would navigate the anxiety, um, was, was just, um, you know, telling Dan, like, Hey, can you just reassure me? <laughs> like, yeah. You know? Um, you know, but, but really like the thing is like, especially since he's been ill, um, it just makes me think like, I have no idea how I would even navigate having a kid like a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like my whole life, my whole life, I always wanted kids. Like my whole entire life, I dreamed about getting married and being a mom and having kids. And then when my ex and I, you know, broke up after five and a half years and I was getting in my mid thirties and all of that, I started to wonder like, okay, what am I going to do? Maybe I won't find someone. I have a biological clock. Like all those things came up. Sure. Now I'm in my very late thirties, right? It's kind of like, you know, piss or get off the pot. <laughs> <laughs> God. But, but this experience really makes me feel like, how do people have children that have anxiety? Yeah. I drive myself nuts. I probably, Dan would probably never admit it, but I probably <laughs> drive him nuts a bit. I probably, if I'm driving myself nuts, right? Yeah, like, totally. And then if I had a kid, and then if that kid is something happened to them, like mm -hmm. I can't, I can't even imagine. And I don't, I don't want to feel like this all the time. It feels horrible inside. It really, yeah. when you read a label and it says peanuts and your mind is telling you that, you know, maybe they mislabeled it and you just are sitting there knowing that it's not true, but you can't stop the thoughts, yeah. right? It's like, I don't. I don't know if I can handle that with children, like human yeah. children. <laughs> totally. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and so, you know, that, that's like, that's like a, you know, another topic for another day, but it's something that comes up, especially right now when he's not, when he's not doing well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, but then, you know, all my friends with kids are like, yeah, but there's so many joys, right. To having children. And, and I'm like, yeah. And there's so many joys to being a pet parent. Right. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> Like they, they bring me so much joy, even, even in these last two weeks, like they bring me so much joy. They're like funny dogs. They're funny. They have very different personalities. Um, you know, like I see qualities in them that I like, I'm trying to practice. Like Noki is more playful. And when she's playful, it reminds me like, Hey, lighten up. Like you can be more yeah. playful too, right? Like yes. when we're tugging <laughs> and they're like, and they're like doing their silly stuff, like it's hysterical. I just like fall over laughing, right? Yeah. Um, Arrow reminds me to be more present. He loves to just sit and watch the world. And I'm like, oh yeah, like, right. There is something really wonderful about this. Thank you for reminding me because I'm so caught up in my head doing all the things. Yeah. Um, I love watching them learn, you know, training isn't always easy, but seeing their evolution is just such a joy. Um, and of course, like all the cuddles, like they are just the sweetest, most loving dogs and like cuddling them, you know, there's a mutual benefit of oxytocin for both of us. Yeah. So, you know, there's just a lot of joy and like, I'm excited to see like what they're like when they're more like adult dogs. Um, knock on wood. Right. But, um, but, um, yeah, so it's like, it's yeah. like, I, I can see how having children, there'd be a lot of joy too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I have that with my, with my puppies. And, and so, um, 
Yeah. I feel like I've left out so many things, but I feel like I've covered (laughs) the basics. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like I have like a bajillion things floating (laughs) around in my brain right now. Like always. Um, first of all, I love, I love the way you speak about the pops. Like I just, you can just feel how intentional and adoring and special they are to you and that, and that you I'm sure are to them. And, um, you know, I just, and that, and the fact that they can be your teachers, right. It's like, (laughs) I love that. It's like, we're always, I mean, we're not parents to humans, but we're both teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, we know what it's like to be around children who are a lot more present than we are because we're jaded adults and, you know, we have a lot more life experience. And so we know, you know, we have more fears and stuff that's weighing us down, you know, as, as grownups. I mean, they say that like, and we're in like our middle age too. Yikes. This is like the most Knock complicated <laughs> part. I know this is the most complicated part of a person's life for women, yeah. especially. So like I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were like, women feel the most free and happy 65 and up. And I was like, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> That's like legit. No, that's like actual research based. Like that's horrible. Are you kidding me? I wish I was kidding you. I'm unfortunately not. Anyway, this is a conversation for another time, but okay. But in the other time, let's talk about when men feel most joyful in their life. What the, they didn't, you know what? They really didn't cover that. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So I can't, I can't, I guess I can't personally speak to it, but anyway. Um, but I just love that the puppies, your puppies provide like teachable moments for you. Yes. Yeah. Right? They're able to ground you and remind you of simple pleasures and being connected and being playful and also noticing your surroundings and taking the world in. It's just like, it's sad and uplifting at the same time <laughs> that we need that reminder from our yeah. pets, from our children, or, you know, there are students, whoever, right. um, but that's, I mean, to me, that's such a gift. Like I was just like, I found myself just like warm in my heart when you were talking about that, because Aww. not only because I could just relate, but, yeah. but because that's, that's a freaking awesome. Right. Those yeah. are, those are gifts that, that pets give us. Um, do you feel like you were given the opportunity to be less anxious as pet parents because of all that training and that learning that you did ahead of time or were, what has surprised you, I guess, maybe in the opposite, like, yeah. Hey, that reading didn't really translate into reality with your top, with your pops. I mean, in one sense, yeah, it alleviated a lot of anxiety because we had a clear plan of what to do. And, and this particular training group, you know, they have these online videos you watch, but then they had this Facebook group that was amazing because anything that came up, you just write it in the Facebook group. And within like an hour or two, a trainer responds to you and you can send videos. And so we felt really, really supported. And like, you know, I can, well, Dan and I, we can wash our dogs. We can cut their nails. We can shave them. You know, we use a razor and we like not buzz cut, but you know, give them like we trim them, you know, we can, I can cut their hair around their eyes. Um, I'm just saying that cause some dogs freak out about all that. And, um, yeah. that was all from a lot of handling and training at the beginning. And so right. in that sense, it alleviated a lot, but in the other sense, it activated my, I'm not doing enough. <laughs> yeah. I should be training them 17 hours a day. And you know, right. Cause then you're flooded with a perfect an- dog. <laughs> Right. It's like yeah. the overwhelm of information too. Yeah. Like I know like everything you just said, aside from the word community gave me a lot of anxiety <laughs> because it was just kind of like, that sounds really emotion, uh, informationally overwhelming. And mm-hmm. I get my, my, my personal anxiety is triggered by information overload. So like that would probably, like you said, it's like, oh, it's helpful, right? There's, there's a community here. I can, we can ask questions and we have mm-hmm. a response from somebody who knows what they're doing pretty reasonably quickly. The other part of it is just like, then you're reading so much. There's such an influx of information yeah. and people sharing their personal experiences. And it's like, it's yeah. that push and pull for us warriors, right? It's like, mm-hmm. what, when do we reach the place where it's too much? Um, but, I, and I just love that you, you kind of personified Noki and Arrow's <laughs> like, you know, personalities. And it's like, Noki knows herself. She's an she advocate. <laughs> and I pictured, I'm like, that's the Abby, right? And then you were like, <laughs> you were like, you know, Arrow is more observant and, and maybe a little bit more of Zen. And I'm like, that's probably the Dan, <laughs> right? And it's just like, I love that part so much. And so I had to make sure I remember to say that because, um, 
you know, there are so much about dogs and, or about pets generally that their personalities can be really personified, mm-hmm. right? They can not just remind us of humans, humans that we love, humans that we don't love, right? It's just like with anything else. Um, but they, they, they're there to sort of be our teachers in the yeah. same way that, you know, we're taught by all the, uh, you know, the input that we're given at any po- point in the day. Um, so, okay. So what about you and Hurley? Like, yeah. So I mean, relate? so much of, oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to a good amount of it, you know, like, first of all, I didn't know that you had cats growing up. I was, I was always very afraid of cats. Mm. I think it was because I had a bad experience with one as a child, but in hindsight, I definitely was in the wrong, <laughs> but I was a child. And like, I yes. didn't know, no one taught me how, how different cats are from dogs. We grew yeah. up with, I always said there was always a dog in my house the day oh. I was born. Um, we never were without uh, without a dog. We also had birds. Mm -hmm. When my sister was living at home for a while, she had a turtle, you know, like we had our, my, you know, my siblings had dogs that they would bring over to the, my parents' house, you know, so they became like our dogs as well to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, Um, I love, I love that you just talked about a turtle and a bird because like (laughs) I had fish and I had anoles, but in my mind, those don't count as pets. <laughs> <laughs> it felt bad when you said so that. I was like, oh God. Yeah, like we had a yeah. lot of birds. I had I had a bird that was my own as a child. Um, her name was Casey. She was a cocktail. She was so cute. Aww. Um, we had baby birds that were born at my parents' house Aww. that like we were shocked. My parents, my mom had canaries and they made it. And all of a sudden we had eggs and actually there were baby canaries and oh my gosh, it was crazy. But look, I don't, I'm not judging you. I do think people <laughs> look at cats and dogs and yeah. those types of pets differently than they do. They're like caged or aquarium or terrarium. Yeah. Pets. I didn't even talk about my hamsters. Like <laughs> Jesus, I'm thinking about all these pets I had now. Yeah. So you're, you're more focused on your, your current reality, right? Yeah. Yes. Parent, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I loved all my pets growing up. I certainly loved mm-hmm. our, our dogs growing up, but like, like you had said, I didn't have the same anxieties nowhere yeah. near, nowhere near, like yeah. literally almost none. because to me, they were family pets and not mine. There was right. something about it that felt a little bit disconnected, mm-hmm. um, you know? Yeah. So I definitely related to that. Um, and then, you know, when Adam and I decided we wanted a dog, you know, he grew up with dogs too. And so we knew, you know, once we were together and, and got married, we, we wanted to have a dog. Um, and so we rescued Hurley, you know, the year it was the year we got married. It was just a couple of months in and, uh, he was two and a half when we got him. And so he was already trained. Obviously there was a learning curve, you know, being in a new home and we had never been solo pet parents before. So Mm -hmm. like there was a learning curve there. We took him to training too. Same thing. He had a lot of anxiety, has a lot of anxiety. Some mm. of it's changed over the years and he's mellowed out a lot as, as he's older. He is a Jack Russell Terrier mix. We're not sure what he's mixed with. And like, everyone's like a lot of people that meet him were like, oh, I think it's this, or I think it's, <laughs> don't care. I'm like, I don't yeah. want to know. Like he's, yeah. he's pretty chill for a Jack. So whatever he's mixed with is chill. And he's been mm-hmm. chill since we had, since we got him when he was two and a half. Now he's like, 13 and a half, 14, mm-hmm. even we're not hundred percent sure. Cause again, it was like estimated cause he right. was a shelter dog. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, a lot of the early anxieties were about crate training. And uh-huh. so like yeah. both of us grew up with dogs that were crated when my parents left the house and we left the house, our dog was crated. Cause he mm-hmm. was a nut, our dog growing up. He would, he would chew and eat everything. Like he, he just had a lot of issues. He had stomach problems, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and my parents had very strict boundaries with the dogs. And so, or or with our, the main dog I had through most of my childhood and into my adolescence. Um, so we just assumed like, all right, we're going to get a dog and we're going to crate train them. Mm -hmm. And Hurley just was not having it. It was just the world's most uncomfortable. It was terrible. Like for, for months we forced him into the crate And he just, it didn't matter all the training, all the stuff we did. He Mm -hmm. just was not having it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we wound up getting this huge ass, like industrial size crate that was like way too big for him. But like Mm -hmm. he had destroyed his previous crates, like completely destroyed them. And so it was nothing but anxiety on my drive home every day from work. I was like, what am I going to go home to like, what's going to be destroyed? 
is he going to be okay? Like he would poop and pee in it like every day. It was, it was awful. And so eventually we were like, why are we forcing this? It was Mm -hmm. like, maybe he just doesn't need to be created, you know? And so we stopped creating him and everything was fine. He didn't destroy property. He didn't do anything in the, in our apartment at the time. This was before we were, had moved into our house, you know? And so like everything kind of was alleviated from there, thankfully. Um, and then I was, I was really kind of triggered when you were talking about the dog park, because that was, um, something that we dealt with as as well. And it was nothing had ever happened at a dog park. Um, but we just assumed like, Hey, we have a pet, we have a dog now. Like he needs Mm -hmm. exercise. He needs to socialize. Mm -hmm. Like let's take him to the dog park. We found a great dog park. We went to it, had good reviews, talked to some people that had went to it. Great. And it was, he would just kind of walk around the perimeter and like use the bathroom. And like, he had no interest in being with other dogs, like Mm -hmm. at all. And when the other dogs would get into a scuffle, like I'd be freaking out and I would be like, and all the parents are like, they're just playing. They're just playing. I'm like, it looks terrifying to me. And Adam would have to, I would never go by myself. Adam Mm -hmm. would always have to be there. He would kind of calm me down, but he didn't love all the energy happening there either. And when Hurley would see this, the scuffles happening, he kind of was like, we called him the referee. He would kind of like jump around them and like, Mm -hmm. you know, bark, he would bark a little bit and he never barks ever. So whenever we, he starts barking, like in the house, it's cute. It's funny. But like when he, any random time when he barks out of the house, I I would just lose it because it was so unlike him characteristically. So we stopped bringing him there after I saw a huge fight go mm, on and mm. it was not even in our side like our, our the dog park was separated into small dogs and large dogs mm-hmm. by a huge fence like you had to leave one re- area to go into another fenced area to go be in the other side and this is another thing a trainer apparently a trainer that was supposedly like you know the shit yeah had come with a client of his and they had a very small like 15 pound dog like around hurley size brought him into the big dog park where there was a lot of dogs between 50 and 75 pounds. Mm. And I was like, what is that guy doing? And I could hear him because we were only separated by a fence. And he, you know, he was like, really, he's like the, the bigger dogs are generally calmer. They're going to embrace him. And the energy was wrong. Like this, this pet parent looked like she was going to just start crying. You know, it was, and they wound up, this dog wound up getting chased around by these bigger dogs. And I, we were like me and the other pet parents on our side were like, what are you doing? Like, go and get that dog. And they eventually had to scoop the poor dog up and leave. I'm like, I was traumatized after that. I'm like, we're done. Right. Out of here. I'm like, I'm never coming back. I psychopaths are here (laughs) anyway. So I know now I sound (laughs) insane. Um, so we had had Hurley for maybe like two, three years and we were walking around our neighborhood. Like we did all the time, Adam and I both. I typically did most of the longer walks with Hurley because my schedule allowed for it, allowed for it. And his, you know, sometimes didn't, but when we could, right, we walk, we walk him together as a little family. And so we're walking him one day and there's a garage open, a garage door open. Mm -hmm. And we're just kind of casually walking and talking and a giant dog now we knew that this house had a few big dogs, but when mm-hmm. we would see this woman walk around the neighborhood, she was very, like, you could tell she had control over these animals. Mm-hmm. She had like four dogs and they were always leashed. They stayed next to her. They walked like a pack. You know, you could tell, I always felt like, okay, like that woman's got her shit together. You know, mm-hmm. those dogs aren't pulling and they're all big and they're all different breeds. Anyway, we were walking in front of this dog's property, right? The dog was the, for whatever reason, the the screen door, whatever the garage door was wide open. So this dog came rocketing at us Mm -hmm. as we walked by on the sidewalk. And like, I went into freeze mode. I, my whole body shut down. Like I saw this happening in slow motion and like this dog attacked Hurley while Adam was (gasps) holding his, holding the leash. So I literally just started screaming. Yeah. I'm not doing anything, but screaming. Yeah. So then the woman comes out of the house. So like now Adam has, thankfully, I I don't even want this happened because God knew, or, (laughs) you know, some kind of higher power knew that I could not have been alone and handled this. Right. And so like, Adam was able to, you know, get this dog off enough so he could pick Hurley up. Hurley actually shit himself. Like, you know, he shit like yeah. this huge 80 pound dog was on top of him. Right. 
he was just yelping and I was literally oh, just like God. screaming. It was so traumatic. The woman came running out of the house. Her other dog came running out, oh, which God. that dog was very chill, didn't okay. care. So she was yelling, got the dog away. Right. But then the, the dog, she, the dog was in like heat, right? He mm. was in, he was so upset. And she, because she didn't come out with a leash or anything, he went, he was still running at. So now Adam's yeah. holding Hurley and he's yeah. jumping on Adam. And now I, now I'm like unfrozen. And I'm like, when you said it was when you said before about like, you don't want to hurt another dog. Yeah. If something happens, yeah, that was me. Like after the initial shock and like the, oh my God, I can't I, like the breakdown happened. Then I was shoving yeah. with all my body weight, yep. this dog off of Adam who was holding her. I was just like, mm. and then I was yelling and oh my God, it was, it was awful. So like, mm-hmm. thankfully there was no broken limbs. He had a, you know, a decent size cut on his leg, mm-hmm. took him to the vet immediately. You know, they, they ran tests. The dog, her dog didn't have any kind of diseases or anything. Like everything was fine. But since then I was, I have so much anxiety walking around in any neighborhood. If I see garages open, yes. I literally yep. just turn around. I will turn around and walk back in the direction I came in. Mm-hmm. If I see a dog like in a screen, mm-hmm. cause it's, it's happened since we're like, if a screen isn't locked or a toddler mm-hmm. or somebody like I've had other parents, you know, or people come out of their house and be like, Oh, you know, my toddler must've unlocked the screen. And that's how the dog got out. And I'm like, I it's like PTSD. Yeah. It's total yeah. PTSD. So like yeah. that, that was a huge and is still to this day, a huge part of my anxiety with being a, um, a dog owner, a pet parent. Um, you know, a lot of the other stuff you said, landed for me too. You know, I, I'm not gonna, I don't need to just like dive into all the same stuff. I definitely didn't spend as much time reading labels <laughs> or things. And like, when you mentioned Zyla told to me like two weeks ago, I was like, Oh yeah. no. I was like, then I started <laughs> freaking out about it. And it's just like, <laughs> that's the kind of thing too. It's like one, one pet parent's anxiety can sometimes become another pet parent's anxiety. Thankfully it's, it's it hasn't gone past that, but yeah, you know, um, yeah. So like a lot of the things that come up for me when I'm trying to deal with an anxiety that's surrounding Hurley. It's just like checking in with my emotions Mm -hmm. is usually number one because, and when I say emotions, I mean my physical body too. Like, it's just like a quick, a body scan, a check-in I'm trying, I'm searching for tension, discomfort, you know, certain level of heat and obviously feelings of worry or overwhelm. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm kind of seeking that out. Like, okay. It's, it's usually like hitting the pause button, stop what I'm doing and check in, um, lots of slow, mindful breathing, yeah. just like lots of it. And, um, I really resonated with the reassurance piece that you talked about with Dan too. It's like going to people who obviously my partner. Right. But like mm-hmm. people in general, like, Hey, have you experienced this? But I do better with like a one-to-one and less about like doing online searches because I get really overwhelmed with like talking to a community online. Like mm-hmm. that wouldn't, that wouldn't fly for me. Um, but like maybe singling out a, a certain person or a couple of people and trying to get information from them is really helpful, you know, but, and just talking about it, just yeah. like with all of my anxiety, just yeah. like talking about the fact that being a pet parent causes anxiety, yeah. um, you know, feels better and is supportive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, it is heartening to me how many parents now I've never had a parent and I'm around parents and kids all the time. I've never, never had a parent be like, Oh, my puppy was so much harder or oh, my dog's so much harder because their children are take up or they're so all consuming as they should mm-hmm. be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always felt like oh, I shouldn't even talk to them about this or like bring it up. So like, it's great to talk to you about it. Cause you understand, like when you were like, how, how do people do this with children? Like, I legit have no idea. I, I would be, I would be like curled up in a ball, like yeah. crying all the time, worried all the time. I, I don't think I could do it. That's like, part. I mean, you know, you said you always knew you wanted children. So for me, it's, I always knew that I probably would never have children because mm-hmm. I just never had a deep desire for them myself love children, love teaching. Um, Mm -hmm. but I kind of, I feel like you should have a deep desire for, um, parenthood, motherhood, if you bring a child into the world and I don't. And so, and then get a dog first. (laughs) Sure. Right. 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 Exactly. And we've had, I mean, look, we've had Hurley for so many years and like, 
we both of us are very content with the yeah. energy and the, right. the demand that dog parenthood um has mm -hmm. and it's like adding a child or children on top of that is i just feel like is a non-starter um i will say a more recent anxiety so like generally my anxiety is about other dogs open doors in houses mm -hmm. like because of that traumatic experience yeah lately it's that our boy is getting up there in age and so like when you were talking about, you know, it's obviously it's so heartbreaking. It's like you have a baby, a puppy yeah. and they're, they're suffering with this extremely rare thing. And it's like how heartbreaking that is. And yeah. I feel like even though we've been very lucky and blessed with Hurley's health has been knock wood, you know, has been very pretty good and very minimal issues over the years. It's just that, like that factor of but their life is so much or yeah. their potential for life. Right. I mean, we could all die tomorrow that, that I'm not saying it's in, it's infinite, but their lifespan is, mm -hmm. is already at a much shorter place, uh, a much smaller place than humans. So it's just like thinking about like, Oh my God, like, but at the same time, it's made me that much more attentive and yes. mindful and like, then you talked about cuddling and it's like, I I'm spending so much more time being really intentional with him yes, because it's like, yes. I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, we'll be blessed to have a couple more years with him. Like mm -hmm. who knows? Nothing's nothing's certain. Hopefully it's longer than that. But at the same time, it's just, that's, that's a new anxiety for me yeah. is thinking about losing him because, you know, he's been part of our family. He's yes. family yeah. for forever and almost the entirety of our marriage. So yeah. That's kind of where I am. That uh, is, that is anxiety a real, train. real anxiety. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a joke, but like, it's because it's real, right? Like I, from the moment we got our dogs, I've had that anxiety of losing them. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I just love them so much. I want them forever. And so, right. you know, Dan and I joke about that me, Dan and the dogs all made a promise that we're all going to be together until Dan and I are 95 and we're all going to uh -huh. lay in the bed and all just go to sleep together. Got it. Right. So, mm -hmm. so even though, you know, you know, Noki is two and arrow is one and Dan and I are 39, like they're supposed to live for like, you know, 50 more years. Yeah. You got this. I know. I know. But <laughs> we made that, we made that vow to each other. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want to ever lose them. I love them so much. I right? know. So I right. feel that. I I mean, I mine are younger, although who knows with Arrow's condition, I, I we don't yeah. know what to know. Like um right. it's a very real fear and anxiety. And I I um I mean, even when yeah. you were saying that about Hurley, I had like tears in my eyes. Like I know. Hurley little boy. boy. I yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, without making it light of it at all, it's the it's the price we pay for loving, right? Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> what we're saying warriors is everything sucks yes <laughs> just kidding get some pet anxiety and then have some mortality anxiety with it and right uh, yeah but I love the the reframe of just like it's the price of loving it's like it, it's hard but it's the right kind of hard right it's like it's it's painful and a struggle but it means that we care yeah and that yeah. we're deeply feeling so yeah. And that's a superpower. Huh. Um, I feel like I have a bunch of questions, but I also have some reflections too. Um, I really like that you shared, um, about the struggles of crate training mm. because I am very passionate in pro crate training because I got the anxiety that if I left my dogs out, something bad could happen. Right. Yeah but you tried it and you tried it and it was safer to leave Hurley out and he didn't yes. get into anything he wasn't supposed to. Right. And so I just, I like that, you know, there's no hard and fast answer to training dogs, but, but the, the goal in both of our situations was to make sure our dog is safe. Right. Right. And so yeah. for some they're safer out of their crates and for some they're safer in their crates when we're not around. Mm -hmm. Um, so that and the was, big thing too, is that like, he was, he had had a whole life out in California for mm. over two years before mm. coming to us. Right. So like he wasn't a puppy. Yeah. And this right. was information that we weren't privy to, right. That right. like, we didn't know if he'd ever been in a crate. Clearly he'd never been created. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Um, and then, so I guess, I guess like the first question that really popped up for me is, you know, you said now when you see 
open garage doors, you turn the other way. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like some people with anxiety might think like, okay, well, shouldn't you practice walking past the garage door? Like what, what is that? We've taught exposure therapy. Yeah. (laughs) And I've done it. Look, I'm not saying that I always Mm -hmm. turn around. I Mm -hmm. test, I test the waters. I pause. I make Carly sit. Mm -hmm. I look, I peer into the garage, you know, as best as I can. I, I take a few breaths. Like, so yeah. there have been times when I have been able to walk past an open garage or like right. a screen door without a big door closed also. Yeah. But there are also times when I'm not taking the risk. I can right. test my own boundary and say, you know what? No, not worth it. No. And I, I actually, I really like that because I, I mean, I like it probably because I would do the same thing, right? <laughs> like, that's yeah. why I like it. Appreciate but, the validation. <laughs> yes. No, because Because I think sometimes we don't need to expose ourselves to more stress and anxiety um, when it comes to like the well-being of ourselves and our dogs. Like I understand most likely you probably won't have another dog jump out and attack you out of a garage, but it's not a 0% chance. And is it really worth the risk when the idea is just to go for a walk with your dog and have it be a peaceful thing, right? And so I brought it up more because I appreciate that you shared that you tend to want or you choose or prefer to avoid walking past them. Um, because for you, that was a lesson learned that like, it's not worth the risk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you talked about being obsessed with Arrow and Noki and like, I'm obviously obsessed with Hurley boy. He, yeah. like, I call him smushy, boopy, booby butt. Like, I mean, I have like 400 nicknames for him that are all like weird and make no sense. Um, <laughs> but he's just the, the sweetest, just the most Mm. gentle, um, happy and calm little soul. Like, I mean, when he does have big energy, it's, we call it like doggy derby, you know, he'll run around the basement and run all around and it's just so joyful. And even in his, you know, his advanced years, he still has Mm. lots of great energy. Um, you know, we take great walks with him. And I just, I love, there's something about just like watching his little body, just yeah. like on the walk, just as like, like little hip sway and the tail yeah. wagging and the ears yes. going up and down. And yeah, I mean, I really, I deeply resonated with everything you shared about, about how often they remind you of things. And it's like, mm-hmm. I learned, I feel like I'm remembering tapping into like my inner child or my, my, who I am, you know, who I want to be. Yeah. when I watch him, right. It's like, I want to be more calm. I want to have more patience. I want to be more playful and joyful and present. It's like, yes. and, yeah. and yeah. And just like feeling him, like obvi- he's, he's in the bed with us. I know that a lot mm-hmm. of pet parents are not okay with that, but he's only 17 pounds. Like, you know, yeah. he's, he sleeps in our bed and that works for us and our family. So like, just like feeling my feet on his body and he usually bat down by the foot of the bed yeah. and it's just like, checking in, like I'll be asleep in the middle of the night and I'll just like wake up and I just like put my foot on him just to like yeah. have that moment of connection. Yes. yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So just like he's, yeah, he's nothing but a, a fur ball of joy. Um, all right. Warriors. Well, we hope that if you are a pet parent, if you're not a pet parent, if you're considering pet parenthood, you'll sort of take everything that we shared, not only just as personal, personal experiences, mm-hmm. personal stories, your experience and your anxiety journey may be very different from what we've described. Um, if you are a pet parent or if you decide to become one and like with any relationship, there are ups and downs. There's the good, the bad, the scary, the heartbreaking, the joy. Um, but you know, I think I can speak for both of us that it's all so worth it. And being a pet parent has alleviated my anxiety in general in so many ways. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so like, we hope that you resonate with any part of the conversation Mm -hmm. today. Um, So Abby, what is your win of the week? Win of the week. week. Um, So my win ties into pet parent anxiety. Um, So like I said, Arrow is having a very rare condition. And part of my anxiety that I haven't talked about is not wanting to be an annoying dog mom like with the vet and everything, Um, you know, especially when he was having issues, like I would call and I would ask for a call back and, you know, uh, 
did you get the results from the urine yet? You know, um, <laughs> right. but also like being very aware that they're dealing with many other people's pets and who knows what they're dealing with and everything. And so, um, So basically our vet was like, okay, so try to go to this specialist. It might take a while to get in. And so I instantly called and we have an appointment for June. And I called back at this other place and I was like, Hey, do you do like a wait list in case people cancel because they make you cancel within 48 hours. Right. So I figured maybe they had a wait list to let other people know. Ah, the other thing is, is this specialist place um, technically or typically wants people to come over two times, one time for the initial exam and mm. then the second for the tests. And I was like, since we've already like ruled out everything, can't we just dive in for the tests? Right. Like my right. vet already knows what. So when I called back a second time, the receptionist was like, hey, so if you get your vet to call in, um, there might be a better chance of moving this process along. along. Okay. So I wrote a really like heartfelt, like email to my vet yesterday. Right. But again, I don't want to be annoying. I know she has other pets, like, you know, she's already done a lot, but it was like, Hey, can you help us with this referral? And, you know, I'm trying to get both things done in the one exam because they, I have to travel 90 minutes away to the specialist. It's not, it's not close. I'd rather go one time right, or two things. And then if they want us back, fine, I'll come back. But you know, yeah. And, um, So my win of the week is that I asked for help, even though I didn't want to feel annoying (laughs) and it felt vulnerable. And, um, and, and she said, yes, she was like, send me one of your many videos that (laughs) I can send along that might also help. And so she sent the referral out today and I haven't heard anything yet, but, um, just the win is that I asked for help, even though I didn't want to be annoying. And the answer was yes. That's huge. Thanks. That's massive because yeah. I feel like, yeah, I mean, oh, it's just like, we should never feel like we're being too anything, but unfortunately we do, mm-hmm. right? We feel like we're being mm-hmm. too much of something or many things. And yeah. all you're doing is asking a question. And mm-hmm. if the answer is no, the answer is no, but in this case it wasn't. And hopefully right. that means that you won't have to have another anxiety filled day and trip and you know, drive the 90 minutes again in both directions. So that would be huge. Right. Asking for help is hard, but we can do it. Right. So when we do it, it. yeah. And, and, you know, she wasn't like, leave me alone. You're annoying. Of course my vet wouldn't do that, but that's like the fear. Right. Um, and I gave her options in it. I was like, if you can't make this referral, like, what do you suggest? Do you think there's another specialist we could go to? Like, you know, I gave her ways to back out. Which was kind of you. And I'm sure she was, uh, you know what? I'm sure that she could appreciate how heartfelt and thoughtful you were in the email. Like, especially with stuff like that, like offering her outs, like um, that's gotta be unheard of in Mm -hmm. in any line of work, you know? Yeah. So that's massive. And hopefully, hopefully the specialist is able to see you in one visit. Yeah. I hope so. And sooner than June. So, yeah, I know that's a long wait. Yeah. That's a long wait. Hopefully that means the specialist is worth their snuff though. They're like yeah. good at what they do. And that's why they're so eagerly sought out by people. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. This actually, this one place is like one of the only places that has any literature and research on this diagnosis. Okay. So, so it's like, good. and it was like written 20 years ago. Like this condition is so rare. There's like wow. not enough dogs to like write about it. Yeah. Goodness. So hopefully they want to see him sooner. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So warriors, that's one of your tasks this week is to think of little arrow and send good, good energy and wishes towards, um, towards Abby and, uh, their family dealing with this sucks. It sucks. Let's just be real warriors. We can, we can state the fact that dealing with that kind of thing doesn't feel good. No, it sucks. Okay. But what doesn't suck is the (laughs) fact that you're here and the fact that you had tuned into this episode and we are so grateful. We love you so much. Thank you for being with us. Um, if you want to connect with us, you can hop on IG. We're at anxiety warriors podcast. If you want to reach out for any reason, you think you'd be a great fit as a guest, you have topic ideas for us. You can shoot me a DM over there, or you can send us an email. We're at anxiety warriors podcast at gmail.com. And in our show notes, we have our Threadless shop link. You can grab some awesome podcast merch, support mm-hmm. our show in style yes. with a mug or a shirt or a hoodie or any kind of any number of fun things that you have over there that we have over there with Anxiety Warriors um, 
logos on them and different fun sayings. Just got my sparkle and shine and all the twinkles mm-hmm. this week Ooh, and my, pick. yes. And my recovering people pleaser. So jump on over there and, um, wrap our show with some awesome swag. Mm-hmm. And warriors, if you can, please take two seconds, smash that five-star rating on Spotify or Apple or wherever you tune in, jump on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, leave some likes and comments over there so we can hopefully grow over there as well. And you can leave us a review, drop like a word or two or 20, Mm -hmm. sharing your love for us and the show and the pod so we can keep growing our warrior fam. Yeah. Thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We're so, so grateful y'all are here. Till next time. 